important for you to kind of realize some context. Uh, before I came to Toledo, our, our program had gone through a little bit of a dive. It lost, we had five losing seasons in a row. When, when I was looking at Toledo, even some of my friends said, why would you go there? Because I had just been a part of a program that had won a championship in their league. And we had won a lot of games, and we had a really good team returning. In fact, after I left, that team went to the NCAA tournament. They, we had a lot of talent. But part of the reason I wanted to come here, you saw we were ranked in the country in attendance. We were actually above Ohio State last year. But that happened because we live in a special community where they really appreciate sports. You guys know that. You're on BCSN all the time. And whether you appreciate it or not, I've lived a lot of places in the country. I've lived in Virginia, California, Cincinnati, Southern Indiana, and here, and they didn't have that. So you have a great, a great opportunity every time you play to interview for a scholarship with a college coach, whether you realize it or not. Make sure you take advantage of that and put your best foot forward, because I will tell you that we all watch those things. And that kind of plays into the leadership that we're going to talk about. When, when, when I first came that first year, we won 18 games. And it was about changing the culture. It was about making sure that we did all the right things in order to win. And, you know, it really kind of took me back to my college years. And I want to talk to you about that just for a few minutes. When I, I came from a small high school in southern Indiana, it was called North Knox. And no one from my high school had ever played Division I basketball. And a lot of people told me I couldn't do it. It just wasn't possible. It wouldn't happen. I was too skinny, no history, wasn't going to happen. But I had a high school coach who really believed in me and encouraged me and pushed me and even practiced against me to a point where I got better and I got stronger. And I was able to be recruited by Purdue, and I got a chance to be a part of the number one recruiting class in the country. And it was a really special group. We, we had all the positions represented, and we were coming into a program that had never been the NCAA tournament before. And so, or won a Big Ten championship. But I believed in our coach. My college coach is the Indiana Fever coach. They're in the playoffs right now. If you get a chance to watch them, you're going to understand that she has a very thick southern accent. And when I went to college, I felt like in addition to learning the French I was taking, I was also learning Tennessee draw because I had to understand what she was saying to me. My freshman year, we ranked number one. We're all feeling good about ourselves. We're in practice one day, and our goal was to start. We thought we were going to be like, and I'm saying this for you because I know they don't remember the Michigan Fab Five. The group that came through that was unbelievable. They all started. They all took them to the Final Four. It was a great group. You guys feel me, don't you? We talk about these things in there like right over. But this group was special. We felt the same way. We thought we were that special of a group. Until one day my college coach said, I'd like to see the freshmen. So we went jogging across the court and we really thought she was going to tell us how much we were going to play and how much she loved us, just like she did when she recruited us. Only this time it had a different tone to it. She said, we won, with, we won before you. We will win without you, and you're expendable. We don't need you here if your attitudes don't change. She said, I'll pack your bags for you, and you can go home if you keep this up. So we had a choice to make. We all jogged to the locker room. We were going to cry. We were going to call our moms. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then, so we all ran to the one phone and argued over who got to call their mom first. The only thing is, our moms all told us, tough luck. You chose that school when we called and you're going to have to figure it out. So we had to grow up in a hurry. The next day of practice, when we're getting ready, we had to leave our ego behind. Because all of our, all of our teammates were so happy that it happened because we needed just a big, humble shot in the mouth. We did, because we weren't being team players. All we cared about was playing. We wanted to, we wanted to play. We weren't caring about winning a championship. We weren't caring about buying into the team. My senior year, We'd already won a Big Ten championship. We'd already been in the NCAA tournament. And there was this freshman class that came in. And they were acting a lot like we did when we were freshmen. And so I jogged over to my coach one day and I said, you know, that old expendable story would probably be a good one right now. And she said, Trisha, honey, we need them. So she got me. She got me when I was a freshman. She got me then. And she was right. I still needed to understand that even though they were acting that way, we really did need them. They were going to have to play a lot. That same group, the year after I graduated, went to the Final Four. They were talented. 
And I had to step back, and even though I was a senior, realize that we needed those freshmen. They needed to be a part of what we were going to do if we were going to be successful. But one thing I just want to say to you is if you want to be a great leader, the first part is taking stock of you and being humble. No one wants to lead somebody who's full of themselves. And I had to learn that in college the hard way, and I'm glad I did. Because I really needed to learn how to take care of me, and that brings me to my first point. Okay? And that is knowing yourself. You have to know your strengths and weaknesses. When I was the head coach at the University of Evansville, if you look back at the records, you could pretty much look at the records and predict when I went through a really tough time there. We had a couple seasons there where we were in the bottom of the league. We were like ninth out of ten schools. And we were struggling. And I really was trying to guess where I really wanted to be a head coach anymore. I almost went back to be an assistant and go work at Nebraska for a good friend of mine. But I didn't because we did a great job recruiting. And I dug deep and said, you know what? We're going to finish what we started. And we really worked hard to rebuild the program and get it back to a point where we won a championship. And it wasn't easy. But I had to ask my team what I needed to improve on. So one day I went into the whiteboard and I gave them the marker and I said, have at it. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Because it wasn't all warm and fuzzy, glowy compliments. They raked me over the coals. And you know what? I deserved it. I got the job at 29. I was one of the youngest head coaches in the country, and I had a lot to learn. How many of you have ever gone up to your friends, family, teachers, peers that will be honest with you, not your best friend who always says yes, and ask them what you really need to improve on because you really want to get better? Great leaders do that, and they do it all the time. I ask people around me a lot, what could we have done better here? Because even if you won a game, in my opinion, you can always be better. And so that's one thing that you need to know. What are you good at? What are you not? And what can you improve on? The next thing you need to know is about your team. I try to surround myself by people who compliment me and challenge me, not people who say yes to me. That was me when I was 29. I wanted everybody to tell me how great I was as a coach. Now I want people to tell me a better way to do things. And that took a lot of maturity for me to get to that point. A lot of soul searching because we all like to be told how great we are. But it takes a great leader to be told, hey, there's a better way, a quicker way, a more efficient way. We could utilize these people differently. And that's the staff that I have now. We take personality tests. How many of you have taken a personality test? Okay, Myers-Briggs, am I guessing? Okay, we take a color test. Ours, you're either green, orange, uh, gold, or blue. Blue people are sensitive, okay? They're the ones that I want to win and I want you to win with me. And I, I don't care about stats or anything. I just want us to win because I care about you. Okay? Those are your blue people. Your green people are the ones that if I told you that we needed to run a certain offense, you'd say, well, what percentage of shots are we going to get? You know, and how many times during the game are we going to run that? And why are we running that offense? Do you have any friends that ask why all the time? Or they're in class. You're in class with somebody that always asks why. And it probably drives you crazy sometimes. Those people play a very important function on your team. And you may say, well, I'm not on a basketball team. You're going to be on a team at some point in your life. It might be your work team. It might be a club that you're a part of. you got to work with people. And it's important that you know what kind of personality they are. The gold people are who I am. And that's the people that like everything in a nice, neat little way. They like to know, like, if you went to their sock drawer right now, it would be perfect. All the white socks are here. All the dark socks are here. And they're folded perfectly. If you went to the gold people's lockers right now, they would be perfect. If you went to an orange person's locker right, right, right now and you opened it, you would hope not everything would fall out. They're the people who want to be the class clown. They probably aren't paying attention right now as I'm speaking because they're doodling. They always, they don't have a long attention span. You better get it out now. And they, they're important for the team too because there's times when, the, when it drags on. And we need somebody to make us laugh and have a good time so we can all enjoy the experience. I like to find out who my team is. And they like to know who I am so that when one of them asks why and I know they're green, I don't get offended anymore. I'm like, oh, you're one of those. Well, 50% of the time we're going to do this and this is why. I'll approach them differently. Or if they're blue, I may say, you know what? If you do this well, the team will love you because we'll win and it'll feel great. And I'll approach them about feeling. But it helps. You have to know what makes people tick. 
not everybody can you treat the same. I know they say coaches are supposed to treat everybody the same. That's hogwash. You got to know who does what and what makes them tick. And if you don't, you're not going to lead. And you're a coach if you're in one of those groups as a leader. Okay, next thing. Great leaders. Pay attention to the leaders in your community, whether it be the mayor, okay, whether it be uh, coaches of different sports, leaders of different organizations. When things go wrong, do they blame themselves or do they blame everybody around them? Great, leader, great leaders take the blame. They take accountability. And great leaders, when good things happen, say, and I'll give you a good instance. Let's say you scored 30 in the last game that we played. And I'm getting ready to interview you. And I'm Dan Cummings. And I come to you and I say, you're awesome. You scored 30 points. How'd you do it? What's, what would a great leader say? <clears throat> Go ahead. Well, I, I, had, <clears throat> I had a lot of support from the help of my team. That's a great answer. I had a lot of support from the rest of my team. What's another great answer? Who, who passed the ball to? Who set the screens? It's just taking it a little bit further. Give away the credit. Because how many of you want to follow that kind of person? As opposed to the person that says, I know I'm great. Thank you for noticing. None of us want to follow that person. And we're all around some of those kind of people. If you want to be a great leader, don't take the credit whenever things go well. Share it. And you'll find that you feel so much better after sharing it because it makes everybody feel like they're invested. Have you ever gone to the bank and you wished you had more money in your bank account when you put your ATM card in? Not enough came out or it said zero? In college, that happens to my players quite often because they don't have much money coming in. But one thing I will say to you is people are like a bank. If you don't invest in those people, you can't get money out. If you want to be a great leader, you've got to invest in the people who you're around. Get to know them. We meet with our players. We spend time with them. I go to lunch with them. I know about their families. I know how they're doing in school. Because when it comes time for them to get on this court and run for me, they're not going to listen to me if they don't think I care. And likewise, I would appreciate it if they cared too. It makes us a family. Okay? Next thing that I want to share with you is this. Anybody ever watch The Voice? Okay? In The Voice, for those of you that don't watch it, it's a, it's a, it's a musical show where judges, four celebrity judges, are, are, have their faces turned while people come out and perform. And if they like them, they turn their chair around, they pick them for their team, or they fight to pick them for their team. Well, in this, they can't see what they look like. They're choosing based on how they sound only. Has anybody ever watched the movie Moneyball? Okay, same kind of idea. In baseball, they're picking the people for their team based on what? Stats. They don't care what they look like. In fact, some of the people they took in that movie, they're like, I can't believe we're taking this person. Look at the way he bats. But they took them and they won with them. I think about those things when I'm recruiting anymore. And I really pay attention to, are they great leaders? Do they do the little things that don't show up in the stat sheet? Because that's huge if you want to have a great team. Well, Nama Shafir is one of those people. She's an Orthodox Jewish girl who cannot ride a motorized vehicle Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, can only eat kosher meals, has to wear a t-shirt. You notice all of her playing shirts, she has a t-shirt under her jersey. She can't show this part of her, of her shoulder. And a lot of universities across the nation passed on her because they thought she was too much trouble. When I took the job and someone told me about her story, I said, let's work through this. Can she play on Saturdays? Rabbi says she can play, she just can't practice. Practice is work, games are fun. I said, okay. That's one strike that we got, we, that works. So then I worked on trying to find kosher places where we could get food and we could freeze it and we could take it with us on road trips. On Saturdays, if we play in the afternoon, we get there before sundown with her, an assistant coach and a player. She can't even use electricity during that time. She has to put it, she has to, the other player will, will hit the button on the elevator, take them up, use the key card because that uses electricity, turn on the light, and then she's good to go. And then we'll make sure that her meals are taken because we can't count on kosher restaurants being everything. Our first trip that we went on with Nama was to Hawaii. Our gym was being renovated, and so we had to go somewhere different to play. We were in Hilo, Hawaii, and she had to walk to the game two miles. We're getting ready to play Arizona. Now, let's rewind. Pre-game meal. We're sitting in the restaurant of the hotel. Arizona's sitting beside us with a 6'7 kid who can throw it down and dunk. 
and impress her. We're getting ready to get her meal, and I take it to the waitress, and I said, I need this kosher meal heated up for my point guard. And she said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we can't do that. I'm like, this is my point guard. He's going to play a lot today. She said, I'm sorry. So I went to the person that was above her, and I said, can you heat this up for me? They had a little powwow in the kitchen. They came back and said, you know what? We're going to heat it up for you, but you can't eat it in our, in our dining room. So I said, okay. When it came out, I said, hey, Nama, grab your meal, and you and I are going to go sit in the lobby. There's no furniture in the lobby. So I went over and grabbed my meal. She grabbed hers, and as I turned around, I, I felt and saw our whole team take their meal. We all walked to the lobby floor. We passed Arizona, who's sitting right here. Went out and sat on the floor and laughed and carried on and had a great time. But the cool thing was, when they raised their plates, they started saying something that I didn't understand. So I said to Nama, what's the team saying? And she said, Coach, I taught them the word in Hebrew for team yesterday. They're chanting team. It's a pretty cool story. They didn't care if she was different. They were just glad she was on the team and we were going to be a team. If she ate in there, we were going to eat in there. It's one of the neatest things I think has happened to our program since I've been here. Because a bunch of people who were different came together for a common good. And later on, we got the last lap. We beat Arizona that day. And she got MVP of the tournament. She's an unbelievable person because she doesn't care if she scores 2 or 40 if we win. By the way, she scored 40 versus USC when we won the WNIT championship in front of 7,300 people. Sold out capacity crowd and savage. A lot of coaches said to me later, boy, we missed the boat on that one. But it goes back to kind of the voice, X Factor, if you call it. How many times have you watched X Factor? Somebody walks out on the stage and you're like, this is going to be funny. And then they blow you away. Because people come in different shapes and sizes. And if you prejudge them, you'll miss out on all the great stuff. Give people a chance. There's a lot of people who have qualities that you would love to have as part of your program if you just give them a chance. I'm so glad she came to our program because I've learned so much. I learned that when we were in minus 47 degree weather in North Dakota, that she walked a mile to the game and almost had a triple-double. We won. We set a cooking timer to when she could get on a motorized vehicle. As soon as it went off, we got on the bus and we flew home. But she stands for what she believes in. Don't ever lose sight of your character, values, all that when you're leading. Write it down. Make sure every decision you make fits in those categories. This is something I learned from Oprah. I know everybody learns from Oprah, okay, before a show went off regular uh, network. Personal board of directors. I have one. I hope you do. If you want to be a great leader, pick people who will challenge you. I have high school coaches, family members, friends, but people who won't tell me that I'm great when I make a decision. People who will be honest to call me and say, Trisha, that was an awful decision. You better fix that tomorrow. Or, ooh, I wouldn't have done that. If you don't have that in your life, you better find it soon. Some people don't even have to be in the area that you want to study. You'd be surprised how many business people do the same thing I do every day. Every day. They lead people. And I learn from them. If you want to be a great leader, start forming this right now. Those are the people who will be references for you for a job. And when you need something, they will be there for you. Don't ask when you need a job. Build them ahead of time. I like this too. You're going to face obstacles when you're a leader. When people are really going to judge you is when you go through the biggest obstacle and they see how you act. Everybody's great when we're winning, when we're feeling good about, when there's good times. But when it's bad is when you really get inspired by a great leader. Because they don't stand by and just let things happen. They take charge. And they treat people the right way. I got this from my, high school, or from my college coach, and I love it. We share it with our team a lot. Because I really do feel that people are like tea bags. You put them in hot water, you find out what they're made out of. That's so ingenious. It's true. And I hope that each of you, when you get in hot water, are the person you wish to be when you look in the mirror when you get ready. Because that's what you want to be if you're a great leader. Energy vampires. Get out that sheet that I gave you. There are different types of energy vampires. I want you to go back to the time when I told you I was struggling at Evansville. One of my friends called me and said, I want you to read this paper. I want you to tell me which one you are, and that's why I won't talk to you until you fix it. So I read it, and I was the Debbie Downer. I had a lot of things go wrong that year. My best player tore ACL. We were thinking about switching divisions. 
My bus was breaking down constantly with my team. We were getting stuck on the side of the road, and I was, woe was me. We had a lot of things going on, and I was 29 years old, my first head coaching position. But he was right. I needed to stop thinking about the problems, and I needed to start finding solutions. Some of you are going to say, some of these people are my family, my friends. One thing that I would encourage you to do is if it's you, fix it. Because people that are energy vampires are the people we avoid. They zap us. When they walk away, you feel exhausted. You have people in your life that way. What you want to do is, if you've ever, the opposite of that, if you ever have a chance to read a, a, bu a book called The Energy Bus, okay, it's by John Gordon. It's one of the best books you can read. It's short, it's easy, but it talks about being an energy giver. It's so important if you want to lead, to leave people feeling full and not empty. If all I do is chew people out, my team will never play for me. If I make them feel confident and I give them energy, they'll give it right back. And we'll have that good mojo thing going on that you see whenever things are going well. And we'll find a way to push through when it's tough. This is huge. How many times have you had people tell you everything that you need to know but you know they don't care about you so you don't listen. It's important that if you're gonna lead people that you tell them how much you care and you invest. We kind of talked about that earlier, but this was one of my favorite leadership quotes. This last thing I think is big for leaders. It's one thing to be a leader, but I think it's important when you start your journey to think about how you wanna be remembered. I always talk to our players about the banners and the rafters. When I first got there, the last banner was 2003. We had to change that in a hurry. Now we've got several banners. We've got two more that are going to be hung this year. But it's important that later on in life, they have something to come back to the gym and feel proud of, that they accomplished. Maybe it's that you were part of something classy, that did things the right way, had integrity. Maybe it's you have a ring from your experience. Whatever it is that you want your legacy to be, make sure all your decisions follow suit with that. And that you can look yourself in the mirror and say every day, I'm working toward this. And I'm making strides. We always talk about details with my team. I love Colin Powell. Uh, I, his quotes are some of the best things you're going to find. But I think this one really talks about it. If, if you don't take care of all the little things, we talk to our team about this all the time. We keep our locker room as clean as we can. Because if we don't clean our locker room, how are we going to go out of the court and do things together and do them the right way? And you'll say, well, that's a small thing. What does that have to do with anything? It's about having pride for our program, taking care of things taking care of the details. Sooner or later, they all add up. Making a good pass so that somebody else can make a good score. Setting a good screen so somebody else can benefit. Those relate that to whatever, whatever area you want. But if you don't take care of the little things, sooner or later, they're gonna bite you in the tail. I wanna just open it up now for questions if you have any, but the last thing I just wanna to say to you is this. Many of you are gonna graduate from high school, you're gonna go on to college. When you're applying for college, the one thing I want you to remember is this. How are you going to separate yourself and be uncommon? All of you want to be great. Not everybody's going to be. Because many people don't want to pay the price. They don't want to be great every day. And that's what it takes. Make sure that you're thinking of ways to make your resume great. That you're doing community service. That all those people in your board of directors think highly of you. That you have one that you're doing all those little things to be uncommon so that at the end of the day you will be. Because if you take care of it now, you'll be surprised how much that pays off down the road. Any questions? All right. I just want to wish you guys the very best. You guys